Last time in Fast History, we talked about the Great Gold Robbery of 1855, the first recorded major train robbery. And we talked about how William Tester, James Burgess, Edward Agar, and William Pierce made off with thousands of dollars worth of gold. Please like, subscribe, Patreon, you know the deal. As the train reached Folkestone, the crates were shipped off to France. Once weighed on French soil, however, authorities realized that things didn't match, one of the crates even being 40 pounds lighter than expected. Bringing the shipment to Paris where the differences in weight were confirmed, the crates were then opened to find lead shot. French authorities sent news to London. The gold merchants argued with the Southeastern Railway for insured payment, which the SER denied, saying that the robbery took place in France, and therefore French insurance should be used to pay them back. Their French counterparts argued the reverse. The SER stated that a robbery of that skill and scale could not have happened in the short time the rail took from London to Folkestone, especially with a trusted company employee like Burgess watching the train cars. Tester was also seen at the offices of the SER, so both were questioned seriously. It was a perfect getaway. The men started to exchange their gold coins in small amounts for British pounds at various fences. Pierce and Agar began to melt the larger bars down into something the illegal dealers might be more likely to buy, and make them easier to store, although they did burn a small hole in the floor at Agar's home inside the Cambridge Villa. All the men invested some of their money into businesses and international stocks. Tester even moved to Sweden to begin working for rail companies there. For months, everything was grand. All things were going fine, and British authorities could not find any evidence on who the thieves were. That is, until Agar started to have family troubles. Agar and his partner, Fanny Kay, whom he had a child with, had a rocky relationship already. But after the robbery, things became very constrained. Kay used to work for the SER, which might have made her nervous with all that gold in her home, with authorities still searching everywhere and everyone, especially company members. She might have argued with Agar to take his gold melting somewhere else, so they split up. Agar, a man now flush with cash, took a fancy to a young lady of the night, and the two moved in together. But her pimp, William Humphreys, confronted Agar about what he regarded as a loss of potential revenue. So Agar and Humphreys worked out a deal where Agar would lend him money for nefarious purposes. Several weeks later, Agar met with an associate of Humphreys to collect his loan back. But as the money exchanged hands, British police swarmed in and arrested Agar for accepting proceeds from illegal counterfeiting. Agar pleaded innocent of the charges, but he was found guilty and sentenced to go to a penal colony for life. Worried about his family, Agar asked a visiting Pierce to take his entire portion of the money and give it to Kay and his child. Pierce said he would, but did nothing of the sort, collecting Agar's portion for himself. With no money to take care of her child and nowhere to go, Kay went to British authorities, claiming she knew who took part in the Great Gold Robbery. Authorities realized that she was telling the truth after examining the burnt floor of her home and finding specks of gold in the fireplace. When authorities confronted Agar about it, he at first refused to snitch on his compatriots. But after finding out Pierce had stole his portion and left Kay and his child destitute, he was furious and gave up all the other members, and even told police how they did it. Pierce, Burgess, and Tester, who was recently fired for his involvement and sent back to London, stood trial. Although claiming innocence, various evidence and witnesses, including Agar, were used against them. The jury only took a few minutes to decide that they were guilty, and all three men were sentenced. Burgess and Tester were sent to Australia for 14 years, but both received conditional pardons after five years. Pierce, since he did not work for the SER while he robbed it, received two years hard labor and three months of solitary confinement. Agar was also sent to Australia almost a year after the trial ended, and granted a conditional pardon after serving 10 years. He moved to Sri Lanka afterwards, and disappeared from history. This has been Fast History, I'm Eric the Lone Pine Wolfman, and remember, never stop learning. <laughs>